How can you increase trust across your local ministry leadership team so that you can serve more effectively together? In this episode, I'm joined by Leonce Crump Jr., co-founder and senior pastor of Renovation Church in Atlanta. His latest book is entitled The Resilience Factor. Together, Leonce and I discuss ways that you can learn how well your ministry leaders trust one another. Leonce also shares how you can build that trust and catalyze a resilient ministry team that's ready to face together whatever challenges may arise. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of Front Stage Backstage. I'm I'm really looking forward to the conversation today, today's guest. Uh, We are proud to be a part of the Pastor Serve Network. And each and every week, I have the distinct privilege of sitting down with a trusted ministry leader and diving into a topic, uh, getting into a conversation on an effort to help you and pastors and ministry leaders just like you embrace a healthy, sustainable rhythm for both life and ministry. And not only do we record these conversations, but we also create an entire toolkit that complements uh, the conversation that we're having. So you're, you and your ministry team at your local church can dive more deeply into that. And you can find that at pastorserve.org slash network. There you'll find additional resources, including a ministry leader's growth guide with a lot of different questions and insights that you and your team can process through. And so we encourage you to check that out and take um, take advantage of that resource that we provide for you. And then also at Pastor Serve, we love walking alongside of pastors and ministry leaders. And our team is offering a complimentary coaching session for pastors and ministry leaders. And if you'd like to learn more about that, you can check that out at pastorserve.org slash free session. Now, if you're joining us on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up. Uh, take a moment to drop your name and the name of your ministry, your church in the comments below. We love getting to know our audience better, and we'll be praying for you and for your ministry. And then whether you're following us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, please be sure to subscribe uh, or to follow so that you do not miss out on any of these great conversations. I'm excited now to welcome Leonce Crump Jr. to Front Stage Backstage. Leonce, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Yeah, it's so good to have you with us, brother. Now, Leonce, you really, as a senior pastor, you champion the idea of team leadership. And I love what you and Warren and Ryan uh, share in your your latest book, The Resilience Factor. Um, But as you and I both know, a a lot of pastors across the country and around the world often feel like um, hey, I am the team, right? I, I'm wearing lots of different hats. Yeah. I am, I am, you know, experiencing a, a lot of different roles. I'm doing a lot of different things. And so um, as we dive into this conversation, Leonce, I would like to start um, with you sharing a little bit about, you know, the importance and the value of regardless if your church is, uh, you know, whatever size it may be, whatever size your staff may be, whether you're you know, uh, out in the country, you're in the city center, you're in the suburbs, um, why is uh, a ministry team, that team ministry leadership so important for ministry? Yeah, uh, for me, it's rooted not only in anecdote and story, but, but really rooted in scripture. In fact, one verse I go back to often is a threefold chord. Uh, is not easily broken. Uh, One may fall, uh, two may fall, but three help each other stand. Um, There really is a sense, even a Trinitarian sense, right? In in the, and I hate to use this large word, but y'all are all pastors, but, but even in the ontological function of God himself, uh, everyone has distinctive roles, but, but, but it's all the life-giving person of God functioning Uh, as a team within himself, even to accomplish the goal of redemption. And so I I think when we look to the word of God and we look at the arc of the story that he's telling, uh, we see very plainly from beginning to end that there were very few solo actors. There were very few, uh, you know, singular great champions. And usually if there were, there was tragedy attached to it, like a Saul or like a Samson. 
but when we look at the Bible in effective leadership and effective ministry, then you often see partnerships, David and Jonathan, David and Nathan, the prophet, Paul and Barnabas, uh, Paul and Silas. There's always uh, a partnership element where the responsibilities are being shared by multiple people. And that that's not determined by your ministry size or your church size. It's really determined by your perspective uh, on how you actually want to accomplish the thing God's put in front of you. Yeah, that's that, that's good. And that's vitally important, I think, as we're looking at what does it mean for us to really serve effectively in, in ministry. Um, you know, as, as we just kind of survey this idea of team leadership and, and think through this, um, there are some elements of, of, of team that really lend themselves to helping us as ministers stay healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have to look far to, to see that, um, you know, painful examples of, of pastors and ministry leaders not really making it. And whether those mm -hmm. examples are, you know, moral infidelities, you know, moral failures, um, you know, whether those, those might be, you know, looking to, to other things to help satiate the soul, you know, getting caught up in addictions, all those types of things, or, uh, and that, that's har harmful. That's harmful for the person, harmful for the family, for the church, for the community. Um, but also just uh, pastors who, who may just be, you know, you know, feeling depleted or exhausted mm -hmm. or burned out, you know, and, mm -hmm. and just not like they can, can finish. Talk to us a little bit, Leonce, about how this, this idea of, of team, leadership uh helps contribute to um healthy ministry for us as individual pastors of ministry healthy ministry serving the kingdom well um and, and kind of for the long haul of, of ministry yeah uh there, there's an old uh african proverb i'm sure you're familiar with it uh it says if you want to go uh um fast go alone and if you want to go far go together and, and I think that there's a lot there um, in understanding that our longevity, uh, our ability to to sustain faithfully over time, uh, really depends on sharing the load. And and I know that's unusual. Uh, you know, I, I know that the the model we're used to, particularly in the West, is you know head pastor and a, a flank of associates and a flank of uh, and and I do think that um, there is some value in in uh, expediency, right, uh, and ability to move quickly when you have a more hierarchical structure. But equally is the pressure and the danger uh, and the uh, uneven distribution of weight that does, in fact, as you just described, it causes. Uh, uh, men to fall. It causes them to run into addiction, to cope. Uh, they don't have anywhere to to take their deep personal pain. They don't have anyone walking with them in their sin pattern. And, and it puts us in a position of absolute vulnerability, whereas team leadership allows me to not only excel in my gifts, uh, but it protects me from having to try and do things that I'm not gifted to do. Uh, it, it helps me to steward my energy. We don't talk a lot about energy stewardship. We talk a lot about time stewardship, uh, but it helps me to steward my energy. It helps me to steward my personality. I'm an INTJ, I'm actually an introverted person. And so too much time in front of people exhausts me, it depletes me. And, and if I'm not healthy, then I will look to unhealthy means to try and revive myself, whereas a, a team leadership uh, structure actually allows us to distribute the work and distribute the weight and distribute the expectations, as well as having a unique support system uh, as we try to accomplish a, a common goal. Last thing I'll say, and maybe we can dive into this, but mm -hmm. I've really been exploring this idea of a polycentric leadership model and and we've been trying to implement that in our church and, and it's messy uh and it's tough but it, but it's also very very rewarding yeah well let, let's let's go that direction leon so I, I would love to hear what you guys are learning why uh and i'm, I'm sure the answer you just gave is a lot of why you know behind yeah, it yeah. but but why why and why are you willing to make that shift even when it it is messy and what's that looking like for you guys yeah, you know, for me, it, it, it usually comes down to conviction. Uh, 
Right. I'm, I'm willing to make that shift, even though it's messy, because I am convicted that this is the best way. And, and it's hard. And, and let me be very clear. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating for a completely flat structure because that does come with its own problems. What I am advocating for is an intersected structure where everybody is operating in their giftedness and they are trusted to operate in their giftedness at any given time any one of those people can be the point leader and that's what i would kind of describe as polycentric leadership so for instance uh we've kind of mapped this out over the fivefold ministry uh paradigm from ephesians 4. i am uh clearly and prof and primarily apostolic gifted it, it is i like to start i don't like to finish i like to get things out of the ground <laughs> i don't like to manage them uh, and it actually drains me to try and manage them uh, and then one of our teammates, he is clearly a, a more prophetically gifted uh, individual. He he is all about the holiness of God and the reverence of worship and fighting for justice and mercy and righteousness. Uh, and then we have the, the evangelistically gifted team member and Doug Nelms uh, um, and the teacher uh, and myself uh, and Brianna and then the shepherd in Sylvester. And so in each of these areas and caring for the flock, uh, fidelity with the word, uh, passion about the lost, um, um, passion about the holiness of God and the reverence of worship, passion about multiplication. We each take point leadership when focused in those particular areas as it's laid over the body and we submit to that. So, so if, if you know, Doug says, um, I really think our next initiative toward reaching people far from God should look like this. Uh, then all of us fall in line under his leadership. And it doesn't mean we don't contribute to that effort, but we fall in line under his direction. Uh, and when you're able to function that way, again, especially if you're the senior pastor, yes, it can be hard. Uh, it, it, it is hard because um, it's not natural to defer. And it's not, especially when you've been given the position of authority. And it's not natural to submit yourself under the leadership of a person that you hired. It, you know, there, there's a lot of different sociological and psychological tensions there, but the benefits far outweigh the griefs. Yeah, yeah, Leon, so that's, that's fascinating. I, lo I love how you laid that out for us. It's very practical, and we get a sense of that. Um, one word that you used multiple times there was trust. Yes. Um, and which, which I think for uh Leon's, for something like that to work there has to be an incredible amount of of trust yes. and you guys you guys touch on this you know in in the book um the resilience factor you you talk about the fact like if you're going to build uh, you know a resilient team this idea of trust has to be um you know you can't just expect it to to be there you have to be intentional about trust you have to think mm -hmm. about what does this mean for each of us and mm -hmm. and i don't want to put words in your mouth brother but i would imagine if you didn't trust the other four of the five it would be even more challenging and and, and would probably be pretty dysfunctional right if you attempted to do leadership in that way so so tell us leon a little bit about this idea of trust how do we what are some ways we can build trust um, and, and develop a, an environment even, you know, through our own leadership of trust and whether it's paid staff or key volunteer staff, regardless, you know, building that team and understanding that piece of trust and the, in the importance of that. Yeah. If I go back to the Bible for a minute, um, <laughs> I, I think the foundation, I know, <laughs> I think the foundation of trust, uh, comes out of first Corinthians, love believes the best. Right. So if we can establish a culture of grace um, from paid staff to unpaid leaders, you know, down to, um, you know, the the person who takes care of the facility. Um, and I would say across to actually, let me correct that, because down is hierarchical across to the person who who um, takes care of the facility. If we can establish a culture where we are in that love believes the best. And so even if I'm rubbed the wrong way, even if I'm irritated, even if I'm right, that, that you are totally out of line, um, I want to extend the runway of grace to believe the best until I actually know the worst. So that's kind of 
the foundation there. I, I think the next piece that you build on uh, from there is uh, psychological safety. And, and a lot of that is, is going to be created by whomever is considered the point leader. And, and the way you build psychological safety, just a few examples, is um, how you respond in conflict. Do you power up uh, when you feel challenged or are you invitational uh, and, and welcome to challenge even if you have to rebut it? Uh, when people are out of line, how do you respond to them? Do people feel free to share their actual opinions and not just the things that aren't going to rub you or someone else the wrong way? So that's cultivating psychological safety. The next layer up from there is vulnerability, right? Um, transparency, I would say, uh, is different than vulnerability. Transparency is allowing you to see into me some things that are not otherwise obvious. Uh, vulnerability is giving you information with which you can harm me, right? And, and so I think the next layer is, is vulnerability, that we have spent time sharing some of the corners of our hearts that if they were otherwise shared in any other environment, they could be incredibly harmful to me. And then I think kind of the last layer on top there is radical candor. And, and once you have psychological, once you, well, once love believes best and you have psychological safety and you've created uh, an environment of vulnerability, then you can have radical candor where I can say to you exactly what I'm feeling and exactly how I'm seeing it. And you don't take it personally. Uh, you actually take it in a way uh, of receptivity because you know that I'm not pulling punches and I'm not shading the truth. Uh, in order to to make you feel better, but I'm actually saying it as it is because I think it's going to move our relationship, the project, the culture of our team forward. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love the, those layers. And as you're describing them, they all make sense and they all sound beautiful. Mm -hmm. But in real in real time, um, it's messy, as you said. I mean, you've, you've said this. We know it's messy. People are messy. Uh, so, Leonce, as as we look at this. And like that, I mean, I think that first layer, you know, oftentimes people can can process through, they can get through, they get maybe to the psychological safety layer. And oftentimes people don't feel safe, you know, so they never get to that candor layer up top because mm -hmm. they don't feel safe here. Like they can speak into, hey, here's something, you know, that, that I see, you know, just to be able to talk about it because mm -hmm. they feel like it might come back to bite them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in, in ministry with our teams, if we're going to build a resilient team, we have to overcome that. We have to we have to fight for that. So, what are practical ways? You know, as, as a pastor, ministry leader, watching along, listening in right now, you know, reflecting on on our teams, what are some practical ways that we can help? You know, build that psychological safety so we can continue up those layers and get to that just radical candor. Yeah, I would say the, the first thing is to go to your team. If you are senior pastor, lead pastor, founding pastor, point leader, you know, vision guy, you know, we've got about 20 different titles now for, <laughs> right. for the person who's up top. Um, but I would go to your team and ask outright, do you feel safe to say exactly what you feel in a meeting? Or to me privately, do you feel like you can challenge me uh, and, and uh, not in a dishonoring or disrespectful way, because we wouldn't want to do that to anybody, regardless right. of their position. But, but do you feel like you can say that's wrong or I don't agree with that or I think that the reverberations of that are going to be incredibly costly? Uh, and and um, it may be depending on. Oh, uh, how unsafe, because the word toxic is thrown around so much now. So I'll, I'll, I'll say it depends on how unsafe and, and maybe not even unsafe, but but how uncommunicated that safety is. The method of asking those questions may be different. It may be uh, a 360 review. It may be an anonymous survey. Um, it, it may be a direct one to one with the person with whom you think you have the most trust on the team who can give you an evaluation of the rest of the team. But, but there are you know, a multitude of ways that you can get at this to, to actually understand 
how safe your team feels with each other and then with you who may be considered the point leader. And then once you learn that, hey, people may not feel as safe as I, I think they should, you know, I might be like, hey, I, I feel like, you know, you could tell me anything, you know, because we say that and we, we might believe it, but they may not feel that way because of past experiences or, you know, mm -hmm. different things they've seen. Um, what what are some steps you can take at that point to make it safe to kind of start building that that trust level in? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of ways that you can go about it. And some of it depends on your governance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us, we have overseers, which uh, are an external uh, board in addition to our plurality of elders. Uh, and our overseers come and do cultural assessments a couple of times a year from the outside. Uh, and they interview staff members and team members and, and I am you know, completely removed from that process. Uh, and then they give me a report and give me feedback on where things are and where things need to change. And, and so at, at times and in periods in the life of our church where there has been low psychological safety, um, that has been assessed and evaluated. And in and, and one of those instances we brought in uh, an outside therapist to um, do some group sessions and, and also do some individual sessions to kind of get at the root of it. Uh, because if it's tied to something that you can't control as a point leader, then then there's really nothing you can do. If, it, if it's childhood trauma, if it's, you know, residual wounds, like those are things that have to be dealt with inside the person. But if there are things you can do to alleviate uh, um, activating those things in your environment and, and create as much buffer as possible, then you should be able to do those things. So we had uh, a man named Ben come in. He owns his own practice in St. Louis. He did several group sessions. He did several individual sessions. And he came back on the other side and he said, here are the six or seven things I think you can do to make this a healthier and more psychologically safe environment. Uh, and it fundamentally shifted our culture. You know, one one of the things, and, and if I'm talking too much, cut me off at any point. But no, you're good. Um, <laughs> one of the things one of my mentors, late mentors, told me, who fell to the pressures that we're talking about right now, Darren Patrick was uh, was like an older brother to me and, and and a mentor to me, and and what he gifted me was self awareness, uh, and how that even robs psychological safety. Because what he said is. There are six factors of intimidation, um, height, size, intelligence, uh, power, intellect, and wealth. And he said, unfortunately for you, you have at least five of those. And most people think you have six. And so when you walk into a room, <laughs> you are already at a disadvantage for creating psychological safety for people. So you have to be even more aware of what your body's doing, what's your face doing, how does your tone sound, do you speak first or last? So th these are all gifts that he gave me, even following uh, the assessment we had from Ben. And it just, over time, it's just rapidly improved our culture uh, and, and really created an environment of psychological safety to where, and this is the last thing I'll say uh, on this particular point, to where you will have uncomfortable moments where teammates cross the line um, because it's become so free that that they have lost, you know, kind of the governors that that they have been um, kept behind for years. And so this expulsive stuff comes out. Now, how do you deal with it? Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you deal with it the wrong way, then you've just moved yourself backwards in psychological safety. But if you deal with it the right way, then you'll actually benefit from it on the other side. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's fascinating uh, to think of the, the layers as you develop. I mean, it's not like you, you do it and you're done. You're like, hey, we got it, guys. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. It's an ongoing, no. ongoing. What, Leos, one, one of the things I, I love you said, uh, the self-awareness piece, you spoke on that. But just even the invitation, um, the invitation for an outsider to come in and evaluate and say, hey, how that takes – um, you know, as a leader, you have to put yourself in a place and say, listen, I believe that, um, the mission that God's called us to is, is paramount, right? Like that's, that's above 
my own, even my own preferences, right? Or my own mm -hmm. ideas, my own thoughts. And, and you mm -hmm. have to be at kind of a, a mature level to be able to say, hey, listen, um, I want to invite people to poke and prod a little bit and to say, hey, here are some cracks. And, uh, and, and not in a demeaning way, obviously, a very, uh, you know, a very hopeful way saying, here are some opportunities, maybe is a better way to say it, right? Here's some opportunities yeah. for you um, in your team, in your church, in your ministry to make an even greater impact for the kingdom. And yeah. so, because so, um, a lot of people fear um, someone pointing out flaws. Right. And that's kind of human nature to a degree. Right. Like it's not like none of us love someone critiquing us necessarily. Um, but if we're going to build a, a ministry team that's going to make a, a lasting impact that's beyond you, beyond me, you know, um, we've we've got to be able to to get to that that place. So what what does it take for a leader to say, OK, um, I'm at I'm at a point where I am willing to invite others in. To 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 put us under the microscope to a degree, um, to to help us see what maybe we're missing, um, what psychologically and even spiritually, what what does that take for a leader to kind of get to that space? Yeah, um, I would say pain and courage. You know, um, there's a certain degree of pain that will force introspection. And my hope is in doing things like this with you and writing books and giving talks and, you know, coaching pastors that I, that I save them from some of the pain quotient. Um, but, but the trigger for me was incredible pain. And, and this is not the podcast to dig too deep into that, but we just had some extraordinary organizational pain. Um, some betrayal, some, you know, some shocking sideways blows. Um, and at that moment, I had to decide, am I going to flee? Uh, and it did cross my mind. You know, I, um, I had opportunities elsewhere in right. places that, I, that I've wanted to live for a long time. And, and I had to decide at that moment, well, it, I can run away and I can be done with this and I can put it behind me. Um, or I can have the fortitude, the courage, the resilience, right, to face it and be a different leader on the other side of it and, and therefore have a different organization and community. Because I do see the church as kind of this dual entity of community and organization. Um, but to have a different situation on the other side of this, and I think that's what it takes. It, it, it takes a lot of time for us for whatever reason, and I do have thoughts on it, but it requires a pain trigger um, and then the courage to do the work on the other side of that pain trigger. And, and so for me, the last five years have been filled with doing the work. I have a counselor. I have a coach. I have mentors. We have overseers. I do marriage counseling with my wife, not um, reactively, but preventatively. Right. You know, I, you know, we're doing family therapy. Like we're doing all of these things. Um, and, and spiritual direction and prayer retreats um, because I want to continue to benefit from the cost uh, and and continue to change toward um, the the better version of not only what I can be but but my influence and effectiveness across the different spheres where where God has given me leadership. Yeah, Leonce, I love that. I love it, and, and thank you for. Um for being that, that open, um, about, I think it, it does something, I think for all of us, whenever we hear someone, you know, say, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've experienced some pain because we've all experienced pain without a doubt. You know, if you, if you've been in ministry, you've experienced pain period, right? We, we can all commiserate yeah. on that together. Right. So, yeah. so we've all experienced pain, but for you to say, Hey, listen, um, I, I am pulling others into my life you know, coaches, counselors, you know, even, you know, marriage, all of those pieces. And, 
and kind of almost normalizing that because I think in, in some ways, you know, it's almost like, oh my goodness. And I, I, I think as a, as a society, I think as pastors and ministry leaders, even we're getting to a place where we're, we're not so caught up in being the lone wolf who has all the mm -hmm. right answers somehow. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we've got to prove to everyone that we've got God figured out <laughs> you know, um, that we're all on a journey together. And, and we, um, God has invited us into community with others. God is intentionally, and we see this throughout scripture, you know, go back to the Bible. We see that just the importance of speak, people speaking into one another's lives and, and, and that whole idea. So thank you for, for, you know, clearly sharing that with, with us and, and how God's using that in your own life. Cause I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, and I think that really ties into the idea of the value and importance of team. Mm-hmm. Because your team is not just, I mean, what you've just expressed, right, is it's not just the um, key staff members or the key, you know, ministry volunteers, you know, in your local church. But your team moves beyond that, right? We, we have, you, have, you have other people who aren't even a part of maybe the local body who are part of our team to help us to honor God well, to serve our people well. Um, and, and to, to glorify Christ. Right. And, and so I love that idea of, of team is in so many different ways happening and, and you're exemplifying that so beautifully. So thank you for that, brother. Appreciate you, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as we're looking at teams, trust is a huge, huge piece of that. Um, what are some of the other factors? And you guys touch on some of these in the book, but some of the other factors that are very, very vital when it comes to, you know, developing, a, like you say, an unbreakable team, a resilient team that can, can yeah. face, you know, whatever comes its, its way. Yeah, I, I think um, some of the other variables are being sure that your purpose is clear. You, you'd be astounded, or maybe you wouldn't, because um, you're, you're in the consulting world and, and care world for pastors. But, man, I go, I go into church teams, and there's 10 different versions of what the purpose of the team is and the executive team and the volunteers and the church itself. And, and so there's no cohesion. And, and if there's no cohesion, there can't be resilience. Um, I, I think a shared mission is very, very important um, to, to have absolute clarity on, on where we're going and why we're going there, why it matters. Uh, and and that that mission is is uh, shared to the core by everybody who who is on that team. I think uh, team composition uh, is a variable as well, and that's not something we talk about a lot in church because you know Sister Sue's been the bookkeeper since we opened, and she's going to die in that desk right. you know, back there, wh whether her work quality goes down or not. Uh, I, I think there has to be a threshold where we where we decide uh, if we have the uh, uh, chemistry and competency and capacity on our team that we need to actually function and thrive. So those would be a few of the other pieces I would add to that trust dynamic that that are all operational, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 they're not just theory. It, it's it's operational for you to sit down with your team next week. And however many it is, and they could be volunteers, just by the way, uh, guys and ladies, if you're listening to, uh, I'm a church planter. Uh, so I did not always have staff. We started with three people in my living room. Uh, and my first team for the first three years were all volunteers. I was the only full-time person, but I still had regular team meetings with these volunteers. And so I would say, no matter what your ministry size or dynamic is, get the people in the room who should be there, who have influence, who have responsibility, and hand them all a blank piece of paper and, and have them write down your purpose and your mission and see how many different answers you come up with. All right, that would be one operational exercise or get the book, The Resilience Factor, uh, and we actually take you through those exercises in the book as well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And in the book, I've, I've got to say, it is a it is so practical. Like, like it's it's not just a bunch of theoretical stuff or, hey, this is what I did in my church or what Ryan did in his church. You know, I mean, it's just like um, it, it walks you through. I mean, it, it shares some anecdotal you know, stories to help you, you know, graph things, but it walks you through very practical, you know, there are diagrams and there are questions. Yeah, that's right. they, I mean, it's something you could take your team <laughs> through. And like, I love the fact that you, that you, you know, put together a resource like this, that you can literally any, any, any church could pick up 
they could walk their team through. And it literally gives you, you know, the reading, the exercises, the things to wrestle through, talk through, through a meeting, you know, diagram out um, and, and really, really pulled all together. So great, great resource. I, I certainly appreciate Leonce and the work that you, Ryan and, and Warren did on that. Um, as we're kind of closing down our time together, brother, I would love to give you time. You've got the, the eyes and ears of brothers and sisters on the front line of ministry, you know, our peers in ministry. Um, I would love to give you just an opportunity to, to speak into their lives, make some words of encouragement um, as, as they're on the front line serving the kingdom. Yeah, if I can encourage you, um, that if you keep your focus eternal, if you keep your focus on the life that is life, keep your focus on the fact that, that we are ambassadors from another kingdom with another citizenship and that the scoreboard doesn't rest on you, right? It doesn't. The wins and the losses, they you can't control that. Uh, if you would keep forefront that your primary identity is not pastor or deacon or elder or bishop or presbyter or whatever your different denominational expert, ruling elder, teaching elder, that's not who you are. Who you are is a child of the living God. And if you would keep your sonship and your daughtership front and center, and orient and organize the work out of that identity. Uh, it won't be easy still, uh, but it won't crush you either. Yeah, I love that, man. That's beautiful, brother. Good word. Uh, Leonce, if people want to uh, connect with you, um, your ministry, learn more about that, or connect with the book, Resilience Factor, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, at Leonce Crump on all social media platforms, and the book is sold anywhere that you can buy books. And if you do buy it and read it, leave us an Amazon review because that helps to uh, generate attention to the work. Definitely, brother. Yeah. And again, I, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic book. And we will have links to Lance's um, socials. We'll have links to the book too. Um, in the toolkit for this this particular episode. So if you're you know if you're working out the gym right now, listening to this, or if you're driving down the road, just just know you can go to pastorserve.org/network when it's safe, and all the links will be there, and you can connect to the book and and connect to Leonce as well. So, brother, it has been an absolute pre pleasure, Leonce, having you on the the podcast. I love this conversation. I think it's so meaningful, so timely, um, and so encouraging. So thank you for making the time to hang out with us, Leonce. Man, thank you for having me. This was an absolute joy. You did a great job. Thank, thanks, brother. And, I appreciate uh, it. And this was a real gift of my time. Thank you. Awesome. God bless you. Bless you, sir. Now, before you go, I want to remind you of an incredible free resource that our team puts together every single week to help you and your team dig more deeply and maximize the conversation that we just had. This is the weekly toolkit that we provide. And we understand that it's one thing to listen or watch uh, an episode, but it's something entirely different to actually take what you've heard, what you've watched, what you've seen, and apply it to your life and to your ministry. You see, Front Stage Backstage is more than just a podcast or YouTube show about ministry leadership. We are a complete resource to help train you and your entire ministry team as you seek to grow and develop in life and ministry. Every single week, we provide a weekly toolkit, which has all types of tools in it to help you do just that. Now, you can find this at pastorserve.org slash network. That's pastorserve.org slash network. And there you'll find all of our shows, all of our episodes, and all of our weekly toolkits. Now, inside the toolkit are several tools, including video links and audio links for you to share with your team. There are resource links about different resources and tools that were mentioned in the conversation, several other tools. But the greatest thing is the Ministry Leaders Growth Guide. Our team pulls key insights and concepts from every conversation with our amazing guests. And then we also create engaging questions for you and your team to consider and process, providing space for you to reflect on how that episode's topic relates to your unique context at your local church, in your ministry, and in your life. Now you can use these questions in your regular staff meetings to guide your conversation as you invest in the growth 
of your ministry leaders. You can find the weekly toolkit at pastorserve.org slash network. We encourage you to check out that free resource. Until next time, I'm Jason Day encouraging you to love well, live well, and lead well. God bless.